Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 29 of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Um, and we'll just jump into some topics. So the first topic is offensive security. Uh, they updated their uh, penetration testing with Kali Linux uh, course, the PWK course. Um, so, yeah, they, they put up this, you know, little article and I'll scroll down to where they have what's new. Uh, so they updated, uh, they have some new modules in there for active directory attacks. Um, they have some more PowerShell stuff in there, introduction to buffer overflows. Yeah, I'm going to just interrupt you and take over on that one. Um, okay. W with uh, PWK, I guess one of the big thing is like they've had like buffer overflows are in there. It's been updated. I'm not sure how much has actually changed with that. It's still Win32. Um, and I mean, I think one of the big areas where they could update is to get some 64 bit stuff in. I mean, obviously there's a little bit more work with setting up like the stack to do any sort of call, like setting up the arguments because you're needing to use the registers instead of it just being on the stacks. It's a bit more difficult. Um, but that's one place where I feel like they probably could have updated. Okay. Um, and I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily fair to put it for OSCP or the PWK course versus OSC, which goes a little bit more, but oh no, I mean, it, it's probably updated to be, you know, maybe, maybe on Windows 10. Oh no, it looks like they have some new Windows 10 stuff. I do think the Active Directory attacks though is really, I think, one of the key updates here, or at least one of the most important ones, because that has been, I think, one of the biggest complaints that you can make against OSCP in the past has been just their lack of active directory attacks in general because that's a key part of like most penetration tests these days is dealing with active directory i mean it's everywhere um so to see a gang in there you know it's definitely a good move it kind of sucks for everybody that you know did the original or the minor updates of oscp i think i i want to say they're calling this one 2.0 I feel okay. like I read that somewhere, but I couldn't find it again when I was going to do my notes. So maybe I'm wrong. But what I do know is basically anybody that's already done OSP is going to have to pay for an upgrade, pay for 30 days of lap time, pay for a new, well, the, paying for the lap time gets you a new exam attempt. And it's um, full price? No, it, it is. A discounted price for it upgrade. is a discounted price somewhat because you're okay. just needing to pay. Um, Let's see here. Yeah, upgrades down here at the bottom. Um, you can upgrade just your course material for two hundred dollars. Okay, so I guess this is actually like four point oh because they're saying upgrade from uh, PWB. Interesting. Um, that's so. Did uh, they change the name? Well, the penetration and testing with uh, black uh, backtrack. You know, Cali's oh, former name. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough to the latest version of PWK. So maybe it is PWK 2.0 and the 3.0 was just the backtrack one. Either way, $400 or $500. So depending on how old your material is, you need to pay the upgrade. Or perhaps this hasn't... Okay, so I actually I didn't notice this before. I just noticed it now, so I'm having to read it. But okay, so upgrade PWK course materials to the latest version. So if you have a PWK, if you've done it since it became Cali, it's two hundred dollars to upgrade. Okay, that's not too bad. To be fair, I mean that's. I think that's. I think it's reasonable. I don't think they should get the update. Uh, the updated materials for free. I think two hundred is fair compared to like the full price is like uh, near a thousand, right? It was nine hundred ninety nine, I think. Yeah, the, I mean that 30 includes days. your thirty days of lab access. I don't think the upgrade. The upgrade I think is just going to be your course materials. If you want to do thirty days of access, that's another like three fifty. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it, there's a cost involved with that. And at this yeah. point, like, it's probably good content, but, I mean, if you've already done OSCP, you're already maybe ha have, like, an intro-level job doing pen testing, it's probably not necessary. You're probably going to have learned already. So, one of the other things that they've added here is um, some stuff about uh, PowerShell Empire, which... I'll be honest, I haven't used it. I don't, or I didn't do a lot of like network pen testing uh, or anything like that, but I've heard a ton about PowerShell Empire. I've seen it over the last few years. I I want to say it's not ma officially maintained anymore. There might be an official fork. I'm not entirely sure who's maintaining that fork or if there is one, but I mean, I do know it's still used. So 
I mean, generally speaking, it's a good update all around. Is it worth paying the upgrade? Probably not, or at least not if you're all if you've already done OSP and have a job. I'm going to make the guess that you can get away on your resume with just listing OSCP, and it's not really going to matter which one you had. That's what I was wondering. I was wondering if, like, you know, employers actually check to see the cert date to see if it, like, how updated the, uh, like, course that I mean, they took I mean, they was. very well might. Um, at least in the immediate future, like, it's not going to make much of a difference. And the thing is, like, OSCP is still very much an entry level of certification so like nobody's hiring somebody think that they're just going to be able to jump right into everything they're going to need some training before they're kind of fully getting up to speed or a little bit more experience maybe some mentorship that's going to be a ne necessity regardless so this update's nice it adds in some things that they're probably going to be taught the other thing is uh bash scripting uh i mean i hate writing bash scripts i'll be honest i hate but it having well, it's some not powershell though powershell's worse PowerShell's so, uh, weird. Power, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's its own discussion. PowerShell, though, just because of all the .NET stuff that's so tightly integrated with it, it's really powerful, but it's so verbose. You know, yeah. typing s such long commands to do anything like it's really annoying, but it's really powerful too. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, it looks like they're mostly folks just the bash scripting there. Which, I mean, it's still nice to know. I mean, there's definitely not a problem with knowing some of the bash scripting. I mean, every so often I'll need to pull it a one-liner. Uh, you know, even when you're in a fairly restricted server, it probably still has SH or bash. Like, it has something that you can kind of work with and apply your knowledge of bash scripting from. So, it, it's a good move to include it. Yeah. Um, and it's something that you probably don't necessarily set out to learn on your own. Like, I mean, when people talk about what programming languages, languages do you recommend I learn? A bash scripting is not one that comes up very often. It's just one of those things where you look up what you need as you do it. It's not yeah. really, you don't really set out, I'm going to learn bash scripting. It's not yeah, really, I mean, because bash yeah. is, it's weird. Like, you know, if and if I, instead of like your usual, uh, like it just does a lot of kind of... I guess not weird for its weird. time. Well, that's what I'm talking about, like yeah. its syntax. Like, I mean, for its time, it kind of makes sense. There were a lot of other languages that use keywords like that. But, I don't know, it's, it's just a good move. I think, like I said, I think it sucks for anybody that just completed their OSCP. I know I saw somebody, like, just a few weeks ago had mentioned that they <laughs> completed their OSCP, and now it's like, oh, yeah, now there's an update. And that that definitely sucks. I think it's a good update. I don't know if I'd say, like, you know, update just because. Um, but, I mean, the, I la the other thing is the lab. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, did you uh, did you get an OSCP cert? No, I, I haven't done OSCP. Okay, um, I've done the other OS courses. Yeah, so I've done OSCE. That's the, uh, uh, what is it? Offensive Security Certified Expert, whereas OSCP is Certified Professional. And I've done the uh, OSWE, which is the web exploits. I'm not actually sure what that one ends up standing for. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the web course, wh whatever it is. If it's web exploit or something, I'm not sure exactly. I'm uh, trying to pull it up here. Web expert. Okay, that makes sense. Web expert, okay. Yeah, so I've done those two. Um, obviously, I've known a number of people who have done OSP, and I've talked with people who have done it. Um, I've seen the course material from some friends that have done it and stuff. Uh, we do have one question in chat. Uh, Belika011. Um, if someone says it's important that they have some kind of certification, I default to they are dumb. Is it just me? No. Uh, it's been a long time, or it's taken a long time for offensive security to kind of reach where they are. Um, and they're still, like, if somebody were... It really depends on the type of job. So in a lot of cases, you're not going to be hurt by having a certification. That isn't entirely true. Like if somebody's, you know, applying for, you know, a high level or like a well, low level exploit development position, you're probably not going to, you know, list like your A plus certification OSCP. 
at, at that level. It's just like they're at different levels um, in terms of what actually matters for it. So like if you're saying like, oh, yeah, and I'm an OSCP as though it actually matters, it, it doesn't. Um, and that can count against you. Um, in terms of, like, I wouldn't want to work for a company that just said like, you need this certification. Just on a personal level, like that's generally going to be a bad sign. Just, you know, they place too much value in these formal qualifications versus having actual skill. Fortunately, kind of within the industry, there's a lot of folks on, can you do the job? Not where were you trained to do the job? Not what your background is. It's, can you do it? And like the interviews are very skill-based, now giving certain challenges, um, Kind of requiring you to prove that you're actually able to do the job rather than just focusing on what your qualifications are to do the job. Uh, yeah, I think in terms of getting your foot in the door that you're, you know, um, given experience, like let's say any open source repositories you have uh, through Git or anything like that, like I think projects should matter more than certs. If you don't have any projects to show off, then I think certs might be a good avenue because at least you have something to yeah, get like in. The certs don't hurt you. I, they don't generally hurt speaking, you, but, like if you yeah. see somebody has something, great. I'm still going to want to spend time talking with them and finding out what they actually know, if they actually even did the certification oh, sure. versus just that. But yeah, no, and especially the other thing, having CVEs, having write-ups, things like that just look good when somebody's reviewing the resume. Um, but still, I mean, when somebody does... Uh, say, you know, it's important that you have some kind of certification. I, I do have to question kind of where their exposure has been in the industry. I will admit on the blue side of things, certifications matter a heck of a lot more. And there are a lot of people who are coming up into security positions now on the red side who start off on the blue side, who start off as sysadmins, who start off doing, you know, the network stuff, the defense of areas and move over and in those areas yeah the certifications do matter a lot more because there is a lot cleaner of a path to get there uh but on the red side of things a lot of it's very skill based um that said the biggest exception to that is government work government work has a lot of requirements generally like you know the u.s government there's the dod whatever directive that lists a bunch of certs that you need um offensive security isn't on there as far as I'm aware, but, you know, it lists a bunch of certs that you need, and it is important. You do need that just for regulation purposes. Uh, and there are some other places similar, like in financial industry, sometimes certifications are required. There are places where it's necessary. So I wouldn't necessarily say that it's dumb, but uh, generally speaking, it, places that are looking for specific certifications, like as mandatory, are also generally going to be considered places that you don't really want to work um at least that's been my experience a lot of people i've talked to have kind of agreed that you know when you see that that's definitely a red flag in terms of looking for a position yeah it seems like focuses are kind of in the areas like you were yeah. saying earlier so um, jumping but... back onto uh the oscp update i will say the lab has been updated lab's been updated now to 75 machines I want to say it used to be around 50 or 55. Somebody can probably correct me on that. Um, and I will say the lab, I think, is what makes OSP actually worthwhile. Generally speaking, you can learn all of this stuff on your own from elsewhere, from free resources. You don't need to take these courses to learn anything. Um, you, you can do that. It's all available free. But there is something to be said for having a bunch of labs that haven't been spoiled for you, which is something that... Uh, with like uh, cracking the perimeter, the OSCE course, like they kind of just walk you through the exploits in the lab material. Like it's all, they spoil it in a sense for you if you've read the lab material. Whereas the OSCP lab, you've got several machines that they haven't spoiled. You have to kind of figure it out. You have to work through the general methodology, the process of, you know, enumerating, going through all of those steps and getting that hands-on practice is like exactly what you need. So having it all there and ready to go, I think is a huge benefit of OSCP. Um, at least if you're interested on the pen testing side, um, they don't do much when it comes to the exploitation. Yeah, it is cool that they do, you know, uh, have some exploitation stuff in there. Like they do, you know, they don't go too in depth into it, but they, you know, they say that they have materials for like uh, Win32 buffer overflows and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it's, it's so. your basic like stack based overflow overwrite, yeah, like you know, stored EIP. But they're at least dipping your toes into it. Yeah, that so that's the thing. Like it's running Metasploit. 
it know is I mean? something that if you want to get into the Xbox stuff, like you need to understand that really basic technique of just smashing the stack. You know, you have yeah. to go back to the 90s style and then you go from there and you learn, you know, a little bit more advanced, a little bit more advanced and you kind of work your way up. Like all of that's still relevant, even if that's not the type of X like you're doing these days. It's it's still background knowledge. It's relevant. So, yeah, it's good. People are getting exposure to that. Yeah, you have um, to climb the ladder, so to speak. Yeah, and I mean, there's a high barrier to kind of get up to your modern exploits. It keeps raising every year. Yep. So, but yeah, we wanted to bring that up because, you know, offensive security, they are probably um, like one of the most respective, respected courses in CERT. In, yeah, you know, I mean, industry, so. in terms of like practitioners, so in terms of technical people who are doing it, offensive security over the years has just kind of gained some respect for having a test that requires you to actually do some work. It's not just memorizing, you know, the exams. And th that's true of the other the exams I've done, too, or, you know, it tests your actual knowledge and understanding like that. You can kind of intuitively understand what you're doing, not just able to repeat uh, specific steps yeah um and speaking so, of uh um just repeating specific <laughs> steps there's the root key signing ceremony uh this is for dnssec doesn't really matter all that much let's be honest but <laughs> the uh root key signing key ceremony was they were going through and testing you know everything to make sure there would be no problems when they came to do this and they identified apparently as the gist of it is the safe wouldn't open i don't know if this has been fixed yet but um it, it's funny that they discovered this the day before too they were like on the 11th we were doing the, the scheduled maintenance or whatever yeah i mean it makes sense that they were doing all the checks right before too so i mean it would have been better had they maybe done the check ahead of time but i don't think a safe failure is the most common common concern granted i mean it is a big part of the whole ceremony and all of that and going through without and they get everybody together for it um and it sounds like this is the first time it's need to be rescheduled in the 10-year history of it realistically i mean it's dns sec it's it has a pretty low adoption anyhow so the fact that you know the root key isn't being re-signed well i don't like i assume they've gotten this fixed or whatever um i haven't actually uh, checked up on it since i saw this on wednesday but oh no i thought it was funny that it happened. And they do have so. a next message saying update on the root KSK ceremony 40. So, uh, and yeah, they have an update on the postponement. So I don't know if they have a new date. Oh yeah, they do. Actually, it was the 15th. So it wasn't delayed by too much. It was, yeah, uh, it was they, only they probably got it, probably got it fixed already. So whatever, but, but yeah. still, I mean, it's one of those things that can go wrong and you don't think about it. And this is something that's kind of, I won't say it's fundamental to the internet because like I said, DNS sec really hasn't had any sort of wide adoption i've heard a lot of people saying they actually it's it's basically security theater they think it's pretty much useless yeah um, i mean I so this whole thing that. is kind of similar to what goes on i believe with like some of the actual like root root keys root cer certificates for um like with certificate authorities for like https and stuff that's what uh, like saying. there's kind of similar basically makes this useless is the common thing I've yeah seen. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it happened and uh, I, I honestly, I didn't know too much about DNS sex, so I was kind of looking into that. Um, one thing I did see mentioned, though, was like, I think Google had a similar issue a few years ago. I don't remember exactly it, like what the event was, but apparently they had a uh, safe, actually, and they had the combination locked in the safe. <laughs> so there was nobody there that knew the combination. So they had to uh, postpone something too. Yeah, I saw people so, comparing it to that. So that was actually, um, uh, was, wasn't a safe exactly. It was a password storage system. Uh, oh, so okay. yeah. So basically like the key to restart, I, I don't remember the exact details, but now that you mentioned it, it was something like the key to restart the server was stored inside or to restart that service was stored inside of that service. So, like, if it was down, you couldn't reaccess okay, it. Okay, I thought it was a physical safe. Okay. No, I believe it was just a password service, like a secret storage service. Oh, still funny, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's worth considering where, you know, if you're pushing for everybody to store everything in those uh, secret stores, you know, it's worth figuring out um, 
or making sure the secret store has some disaster recovery in place. Options. Yeah. Yeah. But those um, backup options can then become the weak link. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, we have a paper that was written by uh, me. No, I'm just kidding. It wasn't written <laughs> well, by I mean, me. It does say Spectre. I mean. It does say Spectre. It's spelled the same way. Uh, but no, this, this was a paper. Uh, it's called The Ballad is Busted Before the Blockchain. And uh, it was basically the security researchers from MIT who did a security analysis of votes, uh, which was a uh, voting application used in the U.S., uh, apparently, it was used in the 2018 midterm elections uh, in West Virginia. So obviously, uh, there's been a huge focus on election hacking over the last couple of years. It's been a huge topic of discussion since 2016. Um, and it's funny to see a breakdown of an app related to voting, considering what recently happened with the Iowa caucus. I wonder if that kind of, um, you know, I, I don't know if they kind of mentioned that in here. I think that'd be pretty funny. No, but and I would have guessed that it was unrelated. Like, no, um, probably, or it not, probably wasn't prompted by it. Like, it was probably yeah. already underway before that happened. But, you know, I it just seems like it would have been. Connection. Yeah. Because they mentioned using, you know, the version of the application that was out in like January something. Yeah. But, you know, they discovered a number of issues and potential attacks that could be pulled off because of um, silly design decisions made uh, when making the app. Uh, some of those, like, were really impactful, like suppressing ballots, uh, altering ballots even, uh, stuff like that. Uh, well, sorry, so here's ahead. the thing, though. Yeah, so the problem is, like, their methodology uh, kind of comes into question. Yeah. They never hit the server. They did everything client-side locally. Um, so kind of found some issues that are basically like they're designed, they essentially they reverse engineered what the server would look like. They didn't actually test anything against the actual server to see if it did anything unexpected or, um, all they did was create their own server and kind of tested a bunch of local stuff. And there's reasons for that. We'll touch on that a little bit later on why they did that. But their methodology definitely kind of raised some concerns just because, you know, they're talking about how it, what the server does, you know, they're, because apparently like uh, one of the examples there is uh, what they refer to as just a obfuscation technique is that the client will, as part of this handshake protocol between server and client, client generates a hundred key pairs and sends them to the server and uh, the client just saves the 57th key pair. And the server does the same thing, sending 100 keys back over to the client um, and does a key exchange with that 57th key again. So, like, it seems to be generating just these random keys that don't actually have a purpose, um, that aren't actually being used. So, is it obfuscation? And, I mean, without them actually seeing the other side of the server, I, I think it's it's really hard for them to actually say that versus whether or not the server is actually looking for something in those other key pairs. Maybe it seems random to them, but they know something about, you know, perhaps the design or implementation of those and, you know, are looking for perhaps the key pairs to be sufficiently random. Perhaps there's a reason to that. Um, I don't know why it would, it would send the hundred keys back though so like i do agree like i think it's a reasonable assumption but at the same time as researchers you know making the claim in the paper there it's i it, it just feels so incomplete when they didn't you might want to stipulate test. it a bit more like that you know that you didn't have like i think they do mention that obviously they didn't have access to the oh, server they but... make it very clear that they didn't have access to the server that they've done like that a lot of this was done with kind of reverse engineering yeah, it's just um, one like, of those things that, like, you do need to, like, keep it in the back of your head when you're reading it, right? Um, that, you yeah, know, and, some of those are assumptions. They're not, you know, uh, verified, if you yeah, want Yeah, well, in all, and in all fairness, they don't try and claim that that one in particular is actually verified. They just say it does that, and we don't know why it would do that besides just an obfuscation technique. And they mentioned registration, you know, submit email, phone number, get an OTP via SMS. Set your eight digit pin or register fingerprint. Um, but they also make mention like there's this next key in an audit token which it receives, and it does they don't know what that's used for. It's not used for on device crypto, and they don't know what it's used for at all. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and yeah, so the paper itself kind of walks through how they believe things work in a law of cases. It jumps through, you know, the various process, what some of the requests look like. Um, talks about like the on disk encryption and some of the issues that they actually came up with, though, are completely legitimate. Like, it doesn't matter about the fact that they didn't do anything on the server side because they focus on client side attacks. So they use Imperium for doing malware detection. And apparently, you know, if you're already kind of root on the device or you've already infected the device, you can just hook the loading for Imperium and be like, nope, don't load or override it and just ignore it, essentially. Yeah, one of the bigger issues was that was like the pin. Uh, I think they said the pin was limited to eight numeric characters. So that's, you know, that limits your... Uh, like it's very easy to brute force that where it's numeric only characters and it's you know eight characters yeah i mean that that pin is usually numeric though so oh yeah for sure but, but I mean, yeah that is one of the other like things voting, actually they want more of a password as opposed to a pin yeah i see so i'll be honest like i i am a fan of well i don't want to say a fan at least not quite yet of some of the electronic voting stuff so but my big thing is verifiable voting and we've talked about this i think it was like episode 13 where i talked about verifiable voting um and i know we talked about in some of our earlier episodes too uh, so you know if you want to know more about like some of the encryption that exists that allows for voting to be verifiable by anybody without um needing to expose you know who voted for who and all of that and like homomorphic encryptions being used there's we've talked about like election guard so while i'm a fan of some of that i'm not yet a fan of any sort of internet voting which is what this is like this is just kind of going too far at least right now um yeah it's fair. there's there's other issues that i do want to bring up about votes uh, but yep. just kind of jumping through these client side attacks, as you already mentioned, you know, stealing user auth the data or sorry, the database being encrypted, it's encrypted with the user's pin. So take the database and brute force the pin. There you go. doesn't matter if the server side has any protections because it does send the pin over to the server when you cast your vote. That doesn't matter since you can brute force it locally by brute forcing the database. Um. So there's that. They talk about doing some UI modification hacks. Again, if you've already infected the device, you can get around the Zimperium loading. And I'm curious to know Zimperium's thoughts on that in particular, like if they intend it to be so easy, if I'm just misunderstanding kind of the intent of the Zimperium thing. It seems hard to factor in like uh, the threat model. Like well, it so seems like their threat model would be someone who has access on the device, but at the same time, someone so who has So that's an issue I have with like, votes, um, yeah. because of their their policies, which, again, touch on right away. But one thing they do mention is they do actually have one server-side attack, which is just based on a, an assumption. It's a side channel that you can infer who somebody voted for because it sends over like the text descriptions of some of the votes. Uh, you can infer by the length of the text who their vote might have been for, even though you can't actually see the content. That's a fair side channel, but I'm going to assume that when you're dealing with like names of people, it's probably not going to be all that different in size or different enough to create a new block um, or to give you enough granularity to actually determine that. That said, I could be very wrong in terms of how this will be used because their descriptions do allow a lot of information. Uh, so it might be possible to determine more. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so I think it's worth mentioning, like, why did they not have access to the server? Why did they have to, you know, do all this reversing? And uh, the answer is, it seems that votes, they don't really want people to be able to analyze their stuff. Um, so that's not been... true. I, I mean, that's kind of how they've presented mm -hmm. it. But okay. if you've taken a look, so votes has a bug bounty. They're on Hacker One. Um, okay. And I'm going to apologize I mean, to people watching right now. For some reason, whenever I use Control, um, the visuals are going back over to the, uh, um, like the browser window is going away. I've yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Every time I hit Control, which also happens to be what all my hotkeys are based around. 
Uh, oh. But so there is a hacker one program for votes. This is where one of my issues comes in, though. Their policy kind of makes no sense, but they do have this. So they are trying to encourage at least some people to look at it. Um, one of the complaints here actually with, you know, because they complain about that votes not being um, not being too transparent. I'll actually pull up. So votes did respond to this. Like to the paper, you mean? Yes, there's the response here. Okay. Uh, they respond to the paper. Essentially, they mentioned a few things. One, that they was using an old version of the application, um, at least 27 versions old at the time. Uh, it never went through the vote servers. Uh, this means they were unable to register, unable to go through any of the identity checking to impersonate a voter, unable to receive legitimate ballots or submit legitimate vote or change any voter data. That's technically true. But all of their attacks work regardless of that fact. So it feels like that one's just them trying to downplay it a bit. Because it's not important. It doesn't matter that they didn't use the server. None of their attacks required that. It would work no matter what server it was hitting in general. I mean, they did make some assumptions that, like, about the obfuscation. <laughs> but generally speaking, not their all of their attacks are just about tricking the client. Uh, and the third thing, though, is... Uh, the, they mentioned how, you know, in the absence of trying to access the vote servers, the researchers fabricated an imagined version of the vote servers and hypothesized how they worked, uh, making the assumptions. And one of the things they label votes is not transparent. And their response is, with qualified collaborative researchers, we are, we are very open. We disclose source code and ho hold lengthy interactive sessions with their architects and engineers. We educate them on the critical demands, blah, blah, blah. That's not transparency. Because <laughs> we have no insight. Like, nobody else gets any insight. That's not being transparent. That's just giving it to the people you like, which is not a transparency yeah. thing. Like, that's... I, I, so I, I like how passive-aggressive they are and, like, they're, uh, that third point that you mentioned where they're, like, uh, since they try to make claims about the back-end server without any uh, source code or anything, uh, it negates any degree of credibility that the researchers have. I like how they kind of take a shot yeah. there. Which I, I <laughs> definitely don't think is true. I think the researchers no, did true. a fine job, especially given some of the issues uh, with the Votes Bounty program. Uh, so, first of all, they Votes has uh, press charges, I believe, against other researchers for testing without their authorization. Um, I believe it was in uh, 2018 that they did so. So that was part of the motivation for not actually including, um, for not trying to test the server. That said, my hunch on that is because of one of the little things here in their policy, uh, right at, I can't control F without breaking things, but um, <laughs> uh somewhere in here mentions test using their test apks uh, okay. essentially they have these test apks um that are you know beta versions that are on like the test areas for ios for android i'm going to guess that these also hit a test server that they're okay with you hitting versus hitting the live server so i don't know what the other researcher did in 2018 I, like i'm not I, I don't have the details on that, but my guess is that they may have been hitting the live server rather than using one of the test servers. And I think that could have been a way for these researchers to have been able to stay a little bit safer is by using the test APK, uh, which so probably th hits a test server. I'm this assuming. 2018 case you were talking about, is that the one that involved the, uh, the researcher from the University of Michigan? I believe so. It's it's the one okay. that they mention in the paper. Yeah, because they mention a researcher from the University of Michigan. They say, like, uh, you know, when he tried researching into it, they tried to paint him as, like, a malicious bad actor uh, and kind of ostracized him. I didn't know they pressed charges, though. I didn't know that was involved. I didn't know they went that okay, far. Okay, may maybe I'm mistaken. Like, I don't have the notes on that, so I might okay. just be misremembering or whatever. That said, with this program... Um, it's it's a weird scope. So one of their things here, exclusions, uh, or, sorry, out of scope vulnerabilities, attacks requiring uh, man in the middle or physical access to a user's device. 
what would we really like you to test and evaluate in our in the mobile apps? Bypassing jailbreak detection in iOS or Android? Uh, manipulation, like basically all of these you are bypassing the payload encryption, bypassing the device handshake process, kind of things that you would generally do by being kind of a man in the middle or hooking things. That's very contradictory. Yeah. Yeah. Like their policy here, like don't man in the middle, but we want you to test things that generally would be attacked by somebody with that level X. Now, to be fair, maybe they're only referring to man in the middle in the sense of the network man in the middle. And not in the sense of just kind of being a man in the middle on the device, being able to hook things. Uh, because it seems like that should be an uh, important threat. And like, yeah, okay, you're not going to bypass encryption by being able to see it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It just... I don't like their program here. I won't say that they're not transparent. Like I kind of said that I disagree with you with the transparency thing. It, it more comes down to like, I definitely don't like how they're running this. I don't, I, I could not trust them. And I think that's one of the important aspects is you need to be able to trust these companies. It seems kind of stacked against the researcher in a way that like somebody could disclose something to them and then they're like, oh, it's not in scope. Meanwhile, like because of how like um, contradictory their policies are, it can make it very easy for them to skimp out on paying out saying, oh, this is not in scope, but thank you for reporting it. Oh, I you mean, know, their, like their bounties are low anyhow. Critical is $2,000. Yeah. High, but I mean, you know, like, thousand, they, might, so. they, they may even use their policy to, to like try to get out of, you know, even acknowledging it. Uh, and that that's what kind of worries me there. The reason I was saying that they didn't seem to be, um, uh, you know, transparent, at least in the context of the research of the paper, is they said that there's been a lot of people pushing for them to, uh, you know, re release more information because their FAQ page and stuff like that is very vague when you go to the boat's website. Um, and they said that even uh, elected representatives has, have asked for more information about the system and they uh, declined putting out any more information in the interest of protecting their intellectual property. Um, so that's where I was kind of thinking, like going there with them not really wanting to put out much information, which is why those researchers had to take more of a black box approach. Because a lot of the stuff we've seen with like voting systems uh, that we've talked about in the past, they're very open. They have the source code. They're, you know, and they need they're not to be. hitting it from a black you box need angle. To... And yeah, I agree. There with shouldn't that. be any sort of veil of obscurity. And I'm sure if we ask them, their reasoning will be something like, well, we don't want malicious attackers to have insights that they don't share with us. So we want to validate everybody that's getting that insight. And I mean, it's a fair idea, but when it comes to an election thing, it needs to be completely open. At the very least, it needs to be open. It needs to be tested. It needs to be tested over a long period of time before it's put into use with anything that actually matters. Um, and that's why, like, while I like the voting, I think we need to move towards that to have more verifiable voting processes versus just paper ballot counting, which is, you know, prone to many errors. Things can be destroyed, whatever. At least with, you know, um, using a system like uh, Election Guard from Microsoft. Yeah, there's better potential to be able to actually verify the election on your own um, and verify that your own vote was counted as you believe it should have been. Like, But without having that open, that trust can't be built up. Um, and without the time of testing, I just wouldn't recommend actually using it. I think that's the biggest problem. Like even what we were seeing with Iowa, which we didn't talk about when it happened at the time, but like it seems like they're trying to push these uh, electronic voting systems into elections too fast. They're oh, not absolutely. letting them get tested it's, thoroughly, and that's the problem. That's the biggest I think issue. that's actually going to be the biggest problem in terms of getting anybody to ever switch towards actually using it, too, is because yeah. all of these things just destroy the trust anybody has in any sort of electronics being involved with voting. Um, I mean, people already, you know, because of Tom Scott's videos, are already pretty much against the electronic voting, although on that note... Tom Scott has his, like, there's the math file and computer file. Computer file has the video against voting, but math file has the thing explaining all the math. And I'd say trust the math. 
math is a lot more trustworthy than humans. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's why I think like the applications need to be tested for a long time. It needs to be like crypto where it needs to survive the test of time. Um, not just, oh yeah, it works for right now. No, they need years of being analyzed just like crypto does before I'd be willing to trust the apps because the apps definitely can be done or can have issues. Although again, with verifiable voting, depending on how strong it is, those apps can be compromised and your vote can still be trusted. Um, like there's again, I don't want to go into the details of how all of that works. It's, you know, fancy crypto and all of that, but lots of math and yeah, Belika, uh, you know, when will companies learn that security by obscurity doesn't work? To be fair, security by obscurity does work. Security by obscurity shouldn't be trusted as your only layer because it will break. I think we should. I think we should stipulate that it works against low level attack, like low level is in low skilled attackers. You know, like script kitties and stuff like that. Security by obscurity will kind of, uh, you know, deter them. I guess. But against skilled attackers, like when you're talking about elections, you're talking about like nation state level attackers against those types of attackers. Security by obscurity doesn't really do anything. And that's the problem. I think security by obscurity gives companies a false sense of security because it does kind of work against like a certain group of attackers. But against the attackers they should actually care about, it doesn't really do much. That's the problem with it. Yeah. So uh, out of chat again from Checkers Cat. Uh, do you all know what most of most of these voting machines are based off? Do they use embedded Windows or something? It varies. The one that we're talking about right now, Vote, is an app you install on your phone right off the Play Store. Yeah. Um, I th- I want to say the Election SDK can be run on that's or sorry Election Guard SDK. Uh, that's a open source thing from Microsoft. I want to say that can be run on multiple systems, but I can't remember. Do you remember what the language was? Because we talked about that. No, I remember uh, it was some really, wasn't it a really obscure language that was like kind of couldn't really read into it too much because the syntax was so weird. I didn't think it was. I thought it was like Verilog or something, but maybe it wasn't. I'm I, Yeah, I'm thinking it was Verilog, but I could be wrong because it was a well, while I'm, ago. I'm pulling it up here too. You're pulling it up? Okay, let's see. Oh, no language breakdown. Yeah. yeah, C, C sharp. Oh, okay. Which one? Okay, I was thinking of something else that we were talking about that was Verilog, I think. Yeah, I, I know we've talked about that before, but... um. Yeah. Okay, but like in that sense, like, yeah, it, it is a false sense of security. I mean, it is a layer of security, though. Um, I mean, if you... Port knocking, for example. If you don't know the port... Actually, on that, I'm not even sure about brute forcing port knocks because you kind of have to know what port you need to listen for next. Uh, that's, I guess, another discussion. But like port knocking to unlock a port, it's security by obscurity. It's just you know based on the fact that you don't know it. It's fine to have it. It's just you can't rely on it solely. That's it. Well, so I, actually, Billy so also mentions like if you would keep a key to your front door in the flowers next one. Okay. That, I'd agree with, is obviously going to be overall weakening your security because you're adding in that back door. And you're securing the back door with some little bit of obscurity. Uh, But security by obscurity isn't necessarily just that. I mean, security by obscurity can be moving SSH from port 22 to 222. Um, You're just hiding it in that way. You're obscuring it a little bit. Um, It's just a layer of a defense if you're relying on that like if you're writing an insecure ssh or like you know admin admin then you know it's not really adding much but it does add an extra step you suddenly you're not if you do just that step you're not going to be hit by the script kitties or the bots that are just scanning for port 22 uh, so that's where I'm saying, like, it does work. Like, I'm not saying it's a good mechanism. It's not, I'm not saying it's something you should do. And when it comes to the elections, I, like, I don't think it should be in there at all. It should totally be, yeah. Uh, it shouldn't um, be in there at all. Like, everything should be wide open and clear so people can actually come to trust it. But part of why security by obscurity is so hard to kind of kill is because, you know, it adds a, that little tiny bit of extra effort. And by doing that, 
you know, maybe it even adds a lot of effort. Uh, by doing that, you're not necessarily... You're not going to stop all of the attackers, but you are going to stop... You make it too hard for somebody who's not determined enough. Uh, so yeah, like somebody who really wants to do it, they can. But... I mean, I, I kind of argue that it's another layer. It shouldn't be something you depend on. Like, none of your security should result on nobody being able to figure out uh, the obscure parts. Uh, the obscure part should r just be to frustrate those attackers. It should be nothing to do with actually... Like, it shouldn't be a key part of your security, which I think, you know, in the example of a key in the flower pot, or under the flower pot, or whatever... In that example, you no, know, your security is broken by somebody breaking the obscurity. Or if you just, you know, obscure an encryption key, you know, kind of the same thing. Um, but I guess I've said my piece on that. So jumping back over to votes. Uh, oh, no, I so think actually. Oh, go ahead. I do have a question related to the paper. Do you think the paper is unfair to votes? Like the you know company behind it, do you think it? They I, should have given. Them I think it's a bit sensational. Sensational, okay. Um, but like they explain their methodology, they have their experimental methodology explained. They lay it all out. Like they're they're not hiding the fact that they did the reverse engineering. But at the same time, when you're talking about the voting stuff, obviously that's going to catch eyes. So everybody just going to you know run with that in the media. Uh, I guess one thing actually I will mention, maybe you'll not. So one thing they talk about is uh, one of the attacks, I, or not necessarily attacks, but um, one of the issues that they kind of mention uh, has to do with how I'm trying to find it in the paper, but it has to do with how there's no... Uh, signing on the voting messages how you know the oh no, I, th I thought i had had the quote up here uh it should be in vote casting somewhere uh but i what it says is beyond the mac associated with as gcm so the messages obviously are sent encrypted and then they're inside of a tls session so besides that the text of the vote itself is other is not otherwise signed. Uh, that's something that they mention here um, in the paper at some point. Um, again, because I'm having the issues with the control, I can't look for can't it search. here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that quote that I just read out is a quote from the paper. And I'm kind of going to argue like that seems really nitpicky. It's it's under AES. GCM, so it has a Mac. Like, it can't be tampered with. It's under TLS. The only real attack... Like, you're not dealing with any sort of networked attacker. You're not dealing with a network MITOM that could modify it. It's got to be somebody on the, on the device. And at that point, adding an extra signature on there isn't, isn't going really to help. do much. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think um, that's a good point to add on the end there. And I will also mention, since we are talking about the security by security, uh, no, they the key is not pinned. They had a pretty easy time dealing with uh, TLS um, and getting around any of the checks for that. Uh, one thing I'll end on is they did also do, you know, code obfuscation and string obfuscation, which again are things that just make me not trust the application. And are you know those are security by obscurity. If those strings actually matter, I mean that is that's not a good example of you know having any benefit from the obscurity. Yeah, but I mean it would frustrate somebody potentially. So uh, moving on to the lateral movement uh, via MSSQL, um, I have to go do something really quick. Could you do a quick summary of this, and then yep. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah. So uh, I will. Okay, uh, awesome. Um, I'll go ahead and stream on my own here for a bit, but, uh, so this one, it's, I kind of just wanted to include this, not because it's anything too crazy or super interesting, but 
it's just fun. So the situation that these pen testers kind of found themselves in is basically they, you know, obviously they attacked from the internet, you know, again, the DMZ, and then in the main network was the MS SQL server. Uh, but what they found was they couldn't just pop the reverse connect shell from that MS SQL server. It wasn't allowed to connect out to the DMZ. Uh, only the uh, application could connect into it and like that connection could be used. Um, so essentially they just kind of worked out how to turn that SQL server once you, you know, could execute commands on it. So it wasn't just magic, but uh, once you had that level of access to basically turn your MS SQL server into a SOX proxy. Um, and they did that using uh, CLR assembly. So essentially, you know, DLL imported in and to get around the networking issue, they would just reuse that same initial connection uh, socket reuse. Which, I don't know, I, I think that was just kind of fun to see, just because socket reuse is something obviously with exploits if you've written many, you've maybe done that, where you just go and find the file descriptor for your existing connection and then reuse that with your shell. And you're going to pop a shell, uh, rather than doing like a reverse connect. So it's kind of fun to see that being used in this situation too. Um... Yeah, sorry about that. I'm I'm back now. I just uh, had to do something right. really quick. Yeah, I just talked over really quickly what it was. I mean, th this one it was more just I wanted to show like, hey, it's there. You know, using that with MS SQL, there is a tool released with this, the MS SQL proxy, um, that you can use for yourself uh, to do that. You know, just be aware of it if it's. If it uh, interests you or if you run into that sort of situation, I like the fact that they do the socket reuse for it. Yeah. So uh, getting into some more uh, technical exploits, I guess, uh, we do um, have a hacker Before we report. do that, actually, you I do want to deal with chat. Okay. Uh, Checkers Cat, I'm wondering why elections are even hackable in the first place. Do these professionals working on election security uh, competent enough to realize an error gap is necessary. Are these professional trustful enough or compromised? Here's the thing, I was kind of talking about that. I think that's where we need one openness. Uh, see, the error gap only kind of matters when it comes to you know the whole networking aspect. And in theory, with verifiable voting, everything- You wouldn't even really need one everything can be compromised without actually compromising your vote uh without actually compromising you know who voted for what or without you know being able to tamper with votes um that comes down to you know some advances in encryption in particular the key thing the key advance is in something called homomorphic encryption which is a special type of encryption where you can do operations like add like add a bunch of values together without actually decrypting the values um, or multiply values. You can do operations on data without actually exposing the data itself when you have these types of encryption or crypto systems. Um, the math is definitely beyond me. So unfortunately I can't go too detailed oh, yeah, with that, super... but you know, it, it is there. There is math to kind of do that. And that would allow one of the key things about is everybody's vote ends up being published um that gets published online now when i say everybody's vote i mean like you there are different ways to go about this but essentially you get like a little hash or something that represents your vote um and there are other reasons why you're able to trust that that vote decrypts to what you believe it is and then you can see that your vote was actually published that it's there uh that it belongs to you like that your vote's there um and then you're able to, with homomorphic encryption, you're able to go ahead and calculate what the total vote count is from everybody's votes that's been published. And people can, you know, confirm that there are votes in there. Um, so then if people have questions about missing votes, that can, that can be addressed and be detected. It's not exactly the same, but it, it kind of reminds me of like a uh, provably fair system, I guess, for, for elections. You know, that you, you, if you want to, you can go and verify it. I yeah, know. that that's one of the key things about the whole verifiable voting thing is you can verify yourself or with the computer, presumably, technically you could probably do it by hand. But if we're talking about a huge election, it's 
it's probably a lot more, but like you can do it, I can do it. Like everybody can run that election and see the same results. Um, and in theory, you should be able to do so in terms of the actual voting systems. Even if some of these things are compromised, they can mess with the messages. Um, again, that has other things beyond it or behind it that uh, I'd encourage you to kind of look at. But I mean, there's a lot of people who kind of step back and look at this from the application security. And from an application security perspective, I would be really concerned about voting too. But from the math perspective, I kind of hold on to, you know, trust the math, which frankly maybe isn't trustworthy math at all. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely fair, but that's why we want the crypto systems to hold up to years of testing, not just, oh, it works right now. And I think that same level of scrutiny needs to be applied to any sort of voting system too. Uh, I'll step off my soapbox though and go back to... Oh, Hacker one. Yes. Go back to some... some Fix bypasses. Yeah, this this was another just fun exploit that uh, was just recently patched. Uh, most of you hopefully familiar with Slow Loris, kind of the attack where you would send your hitters very slowly to kind of consume the connection resource with that because the server can't close it because you're still sending it headers, but uh, you're never actually completing the request. So it's you know you can gain consume all of those connection resources until the server just has no more room for any new connections uh you could basically bypass uh the fix for that or the fix for that type of attack at least in node using like the default http library um by passing in a connection keep alive header uh, and the gist of what would happen is that you have the headers timeout. You know, you set up your server, you can set up, and I want the header timeout to be like headers. You know, if it doesn't come in in this time, you know, there we're done, which works fine. And then there's a keep alive timeout. But what happens is when you the full headers have been received, it sets the timestamp for that to zero. So. You know, great. That's and that's used as like a short circuit value and something looks to be like, yeah, headers are done. Uh not zero as in it's been, you know, however many seconds it's been since nineteen seventy. Uh is how long it's taken. Zero is just a special value for that. Um it never resets that timestamp though. If you because when you have connection keep alive, you're able to send more than one request through. Um uh, so as soon as it gets that connection keep alive, it sets that over to zero. And then you can start sending another request in and do all the headers slowly on that one because it never resets the header timeout. It only does it once per request, basically. So essentially sending your keep alive lets you just skip the mitigation. And I thought this was kind of interesting just because it, to it makes sense when you think about how keep alive works that they maybe didn't think about this case. Yeah. What what I found the most interesting about the report is how long it took to actually get this uh, like published. Um, so this report was submitted a year ago. It was uh, submitted December first, uh, twenty nineteen, and or, or sorry, no, it would have been twenty eighteen, I guess. So yeah, December first, twenty eighteen, and it took uh, like a year for it to actually go public. Um, that being said, I mean the Octet Cloud, um, the person who requested for the report to be disclosed only requested it about a month ago. So it's not like it was requested to be disclosed and then it took a year for the vendor to actually uh, approve it. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those interesting things oh, where, yeah. you know, this is a fairly old issue, but it took a while to actually disclose it. Yeah, and that that seems to happen a lot with Hacker One, actually. Yeah, um, I think we were talking a bit about that on the so last episode. So I've kind of been okay with covering it, just because I am just trying to cover some any interesting bounties that have been disclosed and oh, at least sure. this week saying... there weren't actually a lot of interesting bounties out so yeah I'm i figured it was still worth to cover it uh, no I but it's a good point to bring it. it up i didn't bring that up okay so yeah um the other thing is uh this guy who reported it actually didn't qualify for the bounty program because apparently node.js only pays out for code execution uh, vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerabilities that lead to code execution. And since this is obviously more of like a, a DOS type uh, well, I, uh, weakness, so this it's is, not going to cause a privilege escalation or anything. So they they didn't pay him out for it. Yeah, well, so that's kind of more 
I think less about nodes policy and more about the uh, policy of the internet bug bounty. So I thought that at first too, but when I looked, they actually have separate policies for each oh, okay. uh, Fair um, enough. Person, like group in the program. So I think it is Node.js specifically that has that like policy. I don't think it's all of them in that uh in that group, I guess. Yeah, well I saw that they've paid out with like twenty thousand for something. Or you think that was Shell's shock though, so that was code execution. Nonetheless yeah. uh uh, nonetheless, I think we can kind of move on from that one, though. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the next thing is a uh, trivi trivial privilege, privilege escalation in Windows service tracing. That was a bit of a tongue twister. Um, so this was a uh, a GitHub post from um, uh, this it man, I think is how you, it M four N. I don't know. I'm not gonna try to pronounce that more than I already have. But yeah, he put out a blog post. Um, about a CVE that he discovered in Windows serv Service Tracing. So apparently this is a service in Windows that allows you to get debug information about running services. Um, and what makes it interesting is that any user can configure it through registry keys. So, well, so not necessarily any user. Um, okay, I was under the so impression their exam user, so. Well, so you can see kind of they run the access check to see who can actually edit stuff under the Microsoft, like the HKLM software Microsoft tracing, and then the list of services. And you'll notice that at least one of them, the IP HLP service, is only read, not read-write in okay. their setup so this it seems like the services themselves could decide who can set that up it's not necessarily just everybody can do it but most of them don't seem to lock that down at all uh which is fair because i mean a lot of users maybe do need to have the option to debug that and so i wonder if that is a bit of a contradiction because in the first paragraph they do say it can be configured by any local user so well, yeah, so they can, you can find ways there. to attack it. As for, like I said, basically everything but that one is. Okay, so okay, that was that was just a bit confusing the way it was worded, I guess. Um, but yeah, like the big thing with it was once the file tracing is enabled, it's going to write logs uh, to a directory that you can specify in the registry, and it also allows you to set some other settings. And one of those settings is the max file size of logs. So when the log reaches that max file size, it'll you know. Um, It'll perform it'll a move, move it. for, to, it'll give it that dot old extension, but that move happens as system. Yeah. Which is maybe familiar to those of you who listened to episode 13, where we saw a very similar issue with Windows error reports. And yeah. it would move an error report, the WER file. Yeah, um, so you can probably guess where this issue is going. <laughs> yeah, it's going the exact same place. Essentially, if you've got a move being done by system and it doesn't check for... Uh, these kind of user land sim links, which I don't think we need to talk about how those work. I will, nope. I will drop the link though to, uh, it was by James Forshaw uh, about kind of exploiting, exploiting this to get. Oh, it's even a P zero post. There you go. I didn't even I didn't, I didn't know that was a P zero post, but it makes sense. Yeah, I, well, there's also a video, I think, that we talked about our presentation, but the P0 post was the one that I had readily okay. available. Either way, I mean, essentially, that trick lets you create sim links without actually being privileged. So with that, you're able, when you know that it's going to, when this process is going to run and move that log file and turn it into the .old, you set up your sim link so you can basically have it performed in arbitrary file copy it'll copy whatever file you've copied or sim linked it to and it'll copy that if you create a sim link on the dot old to wherever you want to so you can overwrite dll files in like system 32 and get your injection that way which is what this attack does yeah so obviously i mean you do need a level of uh access already to pull off an attack like this so yeah, it's, the, uh... it's a local privilege escalation yeah, so it was given a 7.8 score because it is a high impact, but you do need that, uh, you know, basic level of uh, privilege. Um, but I really liked the blog post because, like, I thought it was really detailed. It had a lot of, like, really good graphics that could, uh, you know, be interesting, like, 
make it more accessible to people who aren't too familiar with these types of vulnerabilities. So I did just want to kind of shout that out that, uh, you know, it is very thorough and how it details the uh, vulnerability. Yeah, and how to it's a good it. write up. Yeah. So, you know, if you're if you're interested in those types of vulnerabilities, uh, this is a good write up uh, for that. Uh, speaking about something, though, that isn't a good write off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, we have the CSME advisory out of Intel. So more Intel issues. And if you're not familiar with CSME, we love Intel. Converged so. Security Management Engine. Management Engine might sound familiar for other things, but effectively it allows remote out of band management of devices. Uh, so that is, you know, even if your device isn't turned on, as long as it's powered, as long as the chip has power, this is listening and it'll take commands kind of out of band from the actual operating system or anything running on the chip. Um, so you could use that to do things like turn the device on, um, among other things. Like essentially, you can access anything that's mounted on the system, so the hard drive, all of that, and it doesn't require the operating system. So that's what management engine is. And with this attack, it doesn't actually tell us too much about the details of it, so we can't go into it. But effectively, a local user can bypass any authentication on it. Yeah. So not a remote the user. information we have. That, like, yeah, we don't, well, you know, more, more information would be cool, but yeah. it's Intel. I think we've come across other Intel issues in the past where they've been very vague uh, on any information about the attack. And if there is information about it, it's not directly from Intel. It's from people who worked with Intel. So, yeah. Not surprising, but it would be cool to get a little bit more information on that. But Yeah, so the only things that I can actually kind of say is the CVSS score. Um, the acts or first of all, obviously, the CIA's confidentiality, integrity, availability are all high, which is yep. basically the worst case you can have. Um, you know, basically everything's compromised on your device in this case. Um, but the AC is low, the access or sorry, the attack complexity um it's apparently some that doesn't take it's not a complex attack according to them which isn't um, too surprising right like improper authentication usually is like it's you know it's direct, re not too direct request to or exploit. something yeah yeah something like that uh, but that that is something we can say this is a presumably easy attack to pull off but it, it is you know the act the vector is local yeah so you know we just wanted to like bring it up it did happen but not, yeah, not it's too much there. We just we can can't from it. share much about it. Yeah. If we do, we do have some topics that do have a lot of information, though, and uh, we have some Project Zero posts. And uh, you know, if you've ever looked at Project Zero blog posts, you know that they're very dense in information. And this one actually talks about uh, a Chrome bug that they were investigating uh, that was extremely complex. Uh, it was actually this this blog post. I will warn you if you want to check it on out on your own. It does require quite a bit of uh, knowledge in like browsers and stuff like that to understand. I was I was kind of lost in it. Um, Z had a bit of a better grasp on it, so I'll I'll let him talk about it because uh, yeah, this is quite a quite a difficult blog post uh, just because of the nature of like what they're covering. Yeah. So the thing that I liked about this though is they had a bit of a focus on the frustrating aspects of vulnerability research. Which you don't always get. Yeah. yeah, like a lot. It's so easy. And I've mentioned this before. It's so easy to look at some of the write ups and think like, oh, yeah, and they just need to do this and this and this. And then you look like, well, I'd have no idea to look for that. I have no I had no idea that was even a viable attack. Um, and, you know, that's not quite the case here. But, um, you know, in this case, but they include a lot about their reasoning, how they looked for things mistakes that they made like they didn't always just you know get right to the correct answer and you know maybe took some paths that they could have made their life easier using another path but you know hindsight is twenty twenty. uh so coming down to the actual bug um as mentioned it was in a test case here window.open and window.location equals Two requests happen. Two things. That's that's all. Um, obviously, it's on a remote domain. So we know there's going to be more to that. Uh, 
but they notice this is, I believe, uh, yeah, heat buffer overflow in their uh, KSAN output. So they believe, you know, this is a serious bug. They mentioned, you know, this looks like a really serious bug. It's a heat buffer overflow writing data that likely comes directly from the network, which is also noted in the trace. Uh, they figured that, you know, this isn't going to be too hard to find a place where the size of an IO buffer gets confused is essentially what they figured out. This is going to be because it's overwriting a buffer or going beyond. So size in the buffer somewhere, those two get out of sync. Of course, they realized that they were wrong, that this was going to be fairly difficult. And they talk through a lot of their process here, just in some of the assumptions they make. Like like I said, they know or they have a reasonable assumption that it's going to be IO buffer and it's going to be, you know, that size is going to get out of sync. But the bug was no longer reproducing. Um, so they assume that something either changed in the web server that it was hitting or the network config and started, you know, looking into code, looking for code that had maybe changed, things like that. But in particular, they looked for places where there was a read with a buffer, or there was a call to the read, sorry, where, you know, the buffer doesn't match up with the buffer length that was sent in. Generally speaking, a lot of them didn't have that. Uh, but they look through the code, and most of these things don't have it. Um, apparently, they both skimmed over in multiple places this data pickle size call that's one place where it's dynamically done and i mean to be fair it's you know one line of code in a lot and there's uh, a lot of like indirection because of you know yeah well written. so that's the thing the fact that it's getting the buffer length though through the data, like through those method calls rather than just having the data length is kind of what cued them off or piqued their interest in this particular area. Kind of tip them off, yeah. That, yeah, that to was, at least uh, look at it. Uh, the problem is, you know, how do they reach that part of the code? Because again, this is kind of the unique one that does that, but how do you hit that? And that's where this kind of gets really complex. It's in the HTTP cache transaction where, you know, this buffer link gets calculated through those method calls. The problem is that cache apparently has, you know, 50 different states. Or it has a state machine with 50 different states. So to get to this exact one, you need to find something. And to get, you know, an exploitable way, it needs to be something that's going to loop back to read um, and they, they kind of explain what this loop starts looking like, but, you know, they have this lovely graph on screen, which kind of shows how things flow through there. And they also mentioned that uh, it would have been sensible just to build that graph initially to look, but instead we just manually performed a depth first search of the state machine. I think that's just a little bit of a cheeky way of saying, you know, they they just dove right into the code thinking... They'll just find it immediately and without actually looking at the bigger picture, which is just another one of those things like that in hindsight, uh, maybe, yeah, it would have been more helpful you feel, to do you that. You feel dumb. Kinda, but, yeah. but you feel great when you just dive into the code and you find it. That's true. I feel like Neo from the Matrix. Um, yeah, no, I... <sighs> when I was trying to read through this, I did find some interesting bits. Um, when they originally got this report, they actually thought that this might have been a bug that was being exploited in the wild. Um, and that turned out, they said that didn't actually turn out to be the case. I don't know how they confirmed that. I don't think they went into too many details on that. Well, um, so they did figure out the case. And that was that the culprit was this, this website just had loading equals lazy in it. Um, and they talk about what the actual thing was. And that this could be reproduced. They found the website that was causing it. Like it. And they reproduced it. But what ended up happening. Um, was during. So they found this questionable code. Where that size was. Uh, no. Where is it on here? Uh, where that size is being calculated. So they need to find a place where that size. Ends up being incorrect. So what they found, it, like I said, they found this loading equals lazy attribute to be the problem. 
Because what happened is when you had that, it would make this partial request. Uh, you know, it would you know make the MJ do the range request. You know, the first uh, 2040, 47 bytes or 48 bytes, you include byte zero um, of the image. So you'd have that request. It's just a partial request, but it's already kind of had a cache entry now for it. So when the next request comes through, looking for the full image now, it's going to say, oh, hey, this URL is already in the cache. Let's take a look at that. Um, and what ends up happening is it will, because it's already returned the headers, because it, ha it had them cached, I believe, uh, because it's already kind of returned the headers, it will try and transparently restart the request to get the entire thing now. Um, and that's partially because there's no e tag or like no way to verify that if it, if they just did a range request that's not getting like a different file completely. Um, so essentially, it it did this little bit of transparent magic, remaking the entire request, um, and doing trying to restore it. And what happens is it would truncate uh, because it was clearing out the old cache entry. It would truncate the uh, old cache entry, which left the buffer length as zero, which then ended up coming back around to that read, as we mentioned before, um, that they were looking for a place that would loop back to read. Uh, that results in the overwrite uh, because it, you know, had size zero. Yeah. Uh, and so I mean, I'm going to be honest, I've butchered explaining that. Um, it's It's tough, right? Because like Chrome, like when you're talking about browsers, it's very, it requires a very deep knowledge. Well, on this one internals. in particular is very kind of, it's fairly deep in there too. Like it's not, it's not a really immediately obvious issue. Like, I mean, the issue is obvious, but, or not obvious, but it's, um, it takes a lot to get your head around the state that leads to the issue. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because it's, it's not just some direct piece of code. Like you have this code followed by this code that makes it vulnerable. It's you have this state which does this, which has the side effect of setting this value, which leads to this being exploited. Yeah, it's kind of, it kind of hurts your brain to try to understand it. But um, yeah, and they actually there's a part two to this, which ends up talking about the actual exploitation of this bug, uh, which I haven't had a chance to actually look at, so I can't comment on. But there is a part two if you want to check that out. Yeah, uh, one of the other things that I think is worth noting is um, at the beginning they talk about how all of a sudden it stopped triggering; they couldn't reproduce the the crash, and uh, they actually mention in the chapter three about why that was. And they said the reason that it stopped reproducing on Android was because of an unrelated change that influenced the scheduling enough to prevent the issue from triggering. Um, and they said it was just bad luck that it it, it landed right before the. Uh, right before cluster fuzz encountered the issue so it was pretty funny i mean um it just goes to show that something like this issue is so complex that something like the scheduling which is obviously really low level can influence how hittable it actually is yeah so, well, so they also um kind of mentioned that they didn't have kind of the same environment set up a development environment set up for chrome uh, so they kind of ignored the fact that there was that minor change because it didn't seem related. Yeah, uh, which is a common mistake. They shouldn't have done, but common mistake in exploitation, I think, is like neglecting things that you think are unrelated, but actually well, you, end up you impacting make, it you a end lot. up making the assumption that oh yeah, that's not related to that. That that wouldn't matter here, and it does. It's very easy to make those assumptions. Yeah. So uh, Project Zero was very. Um, very generous this week and we actually got another blog post uh this one focuses more on kernel so this one is a lot more accessible than the last one i think uh it talks about a bug in samsung's android kernel uh which is in an added security subsystem called praca or process authenticator and um this basically tracks process identities based on signatures attached to executables they mostly do it for system files they don't do it for all files but they, they found some logic bugs in the process lookup table for getting um, those hash tables for the process for the signatures. And um, they have a mapping where uh, the PID, which in this context is per thread ID, not per uh, per group ID, ID. So, you know, the per thread ID 
uh, is like the key into the mapping and the value is that hash table object. Um, but they have some issues that allow the state to become desynchronized easily. Um, so they actually found two issues. Uh, the second one is actually more serious than what they actually exploit. But the first issue is um, the PROCA might believe that an execution has occurred before the point of no return in the exec v e syscall. So it could abort um, leaving the original executable running, but letting PROCA think that a new executable is actually running. So if there were any privileged executables um, that were running in this, you could actually impersonate them. Um, but judging by the wording, it seems like they kind of explored that avenue but couldn't really find anything. Um, but the second issue is that PIDs can actually be reused before the task free hook is executed. So you can end up with two tasks that have the same PID reference in the subsystem. And um, since we're talking about desynchronization, you can, you can guess where that might go. Because if you assume that a thread has exclusive access to its own table, if two, if two different tasks can access that same object, it's easy to have race conditions because you're not going to be accounting for two different threads having access to that. Um, it, that wasn't, you know, in mind when they were designing it. So, you know, it, it's basically a classic race condition. Uh, they grab a raw pointer to the item. Uh, they don't increment a ref count or anything like that. Uh, they drop the lock and then they take the lock again. And this is kind of a common anti-pattern. So in that little window where yeah, they well, drop it's, the it's, lock so it's before common... requiring it, it's a common anti-pattern just because, I mean, you'll have a function and you kind of want to keep your function nice and self-contained. Yeah. Um, going from, so when you switch functions, you, you drop the lock and then the other function immediately is going to try and pick up that lock again. Um, so I did want to mention there, like, it, there's a reason for that. It, it's commonly because you end up calling a function that uh, could sleep. And you generally don't want to hold locks uh, whilst like running a function that could sleep in the Linux kernel because that's or in kernel at all, I should say, um, because that could have like some major performance implications. So, yeah, but, you know, they didn't even really consider that that could be an issue because they didn't have in mind that two different tasks could grab the same identifier. So, um, yeah, you could trigger it a number of ways uh, with the UAF. You could also hit a double free. They decided not to hit that. They went with a more conventional um, use after free. So they go into some like details about how they, you know, triggered the race um, and how they exploited it. And they actually, they talked about a cool trick where they widened the race window because it was kind of a tight race. Um, basically, they just added a lot of entries to force the... Uh, well, so force not, it into not just add it. I think it's worth kind of going into that okay. a little bit more. Um, so the situation you have is what happens in the it's, so you've got a hash map that contains these numeric pids um and they're going to be attached so hash map the key is the numeric pid the value is the uh task description uh proca underscore task underscore description or desker dscr um so you've got that lookup that's going to happen now if you're not familiar with or actually sorry jumping back to the exploit here so you're basically racing part of that lookup. You want to end up getting two threads in with who have done that lookup. Um, yeah, so they get the same pointer reference. Yeah, so they, so they the both have reference. that same pointer reference. Um, so anyway, talking about this attack, though, to kind of widen that window, you need, you need that lookup to take long enough that it can get interrupted and another thread can kind of get in there too. Yeah. Before things get left. So with hash maps... A hash map isn't like your crypto hash. It's it's not necessarily a very secure hash that's used. Uh, collisions are really common. So what happens is you'll store maybe this. A really simple example would be to store you know just everything in a, in in an array. So maybe you'll take that pid and y'all. This wouldn't be a good hash. Please don't do this. You'll just you know mod five. And let's say we have an index or we have an array of five, which is not not the case. But like your hash method is just to, you know, mod five, just, you know, get that one integer value that represents whatever the actual value that was passed in. So you have multiple things kind of hitting each index. So you store it in a linked list. Uh, so if you're able to have multiple PIDs that all kind of hash to the same value, um, you're able to kind of keep entering PIDs and creating a long linked list under that one hash value. 
Um, and that will take a long time to kind of look up. That's kind of the trick that they use is to have a lot of PIDs that all hashed out to the same value in particular. It wasn't just adding a lot of PIDs. It was PIDs of a specific value that would kind of result, or well, in terms of the hash value, how the hash was calculated, um, would result in a lot of them in basically a long lookup because it just does a, a brute force lookup, I believe. It doesn't have any sort of quick lookup method. That's a good point. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning is this object that gets UAF'd, uh, it's in the kmalloc128 cache. Um, for those of you that aren't too familiar with like uh, kernel exploitation and those caches, that is a really good cache to hit. It's usually pretty stable because basically... When you're talking about kernel, the smaller the allocation size, the more uh, noise there's going to be in that cache. So kmalloc128, it's used a lot, but it's not used as much as kmalloc64. So you have less of a chance of like your pointer getting stolen away from you when you're trying to exploit it. So yeah, that's that's one thing that I think is worth mentioning here. Um, it actually, they go even more in depth and actually chain an older bug that they found, that uh, an info leak, to actually defeat privileged access never. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with ARM, privileged access never, it's basically the same as SMAP. That's just the uh, ARM terminology of it, which, you know, they're talking about Android, so that makes sense that they're talking about it in terms of PAN. Um, and the, the info leak is kind of interesting too. It's pretty trivial. It's basically that uh, the proc stack interface, um, there was a bug where it could interpret random data as stack frames because the task... Uh, if there was a task that was running concurrently, it would try to use the task last scheduled off the CPU for that information. So they kind of chain an older bug with this bug to show how you can get an arbitrary read-write even against mitigations like PAN, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but uh, do you want to get into some of the like controversy around this, I guess? Or not controversy, but some of the drama, I guess? Well, so the Samsung... like Samsung, So at yeah. the end of this Project Zero post... Uh, I'll scroll all the way down there. Pretty long post. Um, in their conclusion, um, I'll just quote it here. In my opinion, some of the custom features that Samsung added, and this Proca Proca thing is a custom feature added, are unnecessary and can be removed without any loss of value. I can't tell what Proca is supposed to do, but uh. The sec restricts sec UID seems designed, so I think that's another feature. Uh, seems to be designed to restrict an attacker who already has gained arbitrary kernel read write, which to me seems futile, and engineering resources will have been better spent preventing an attacker from getting to that point in the first place. Um, and the other point they make is about uh, drive drive sorry, device-specific kernel modifications will have been better off either being upstreamed or moved into user space drivers where you can use a safer language. Uh, I, so I agree with that last point, uh, you know, moving towards, just moving towards safer languages in general is a good move. Uh, moving towards less, running less stuff in the privilege mode, again, good move. I'm not sure I totally agree with um the other point though uh that seems like this is designed to restrict an attacker who's already gained arbitrary kernel read write uh it's futile and engineering resource should be better spent elsewhere so you can make a similar argument aslr is useless i mean it's there to or nx is useless because it's there for an attacker that already has you know, whatever level of access to write to the or to the memory. So resource should be spent on preventing that from happening. Um, so my, my thought there is just. I know, so I'll be honest and say like that isn't that isn't a fair comparison. The kernel is, of course, very different, like kernel read write is very different from uh, user space read write, but I mean, with hypervisors being more common these days, you know, in more consumer devices, is it that unwarranted to start spending time with higher level mitigations? 
that mitigate what somebody can do with their kernel read write. I don't think I don't think it's unwarranted. I think it's something that should be considered. So I, I think I think I'm going to be charitable. I think they that that was kind of uh, misworded. I don't think it's totally useless. I think what the argument is is that it's it's not worth the trade off because with Samsung adding all these additional like security measures in the kernel, uh, they mention like it makes it a lot harder to rebase the kernel. Um, so you know that results in the kernel being updated less often. Um, so, you know, there's more end days present typically in like Samsung devices. Um, so it's like, yeah, you do get this additional protection, even if you have the read write, like you were saying, it could be, you know, at least a step to make it harder. It's not going to stop them entirely. But it's not really worth that trade off of how much harder it makes it to to update the kernel uh, to like the upstream version later on. And I think that's that's kind of like the big thing that they're trying to go for here is that the Android ecosystem um, vendors trying to make all these custom modifications are what kind of fragments it so badly. Yeah, uh, so on, on that point, I, I could definitely agree with that. I think there should be a greater priority made on uh, being able to pull those patches in from upstream. Like, for sure, I, yeah. I think... I d I'd agree that the trade-off probably isn't worth it. Um, so yeah, maybe I was just misunderstanding and misunderstanding kind of the point they were trying to make with that. Um, because like I, there is value in at least doing some research into those higher level mitigations because it's, it's not going away, you know, soon you'll be able to assume that an attacker can get that kernel read, right. And how do you prevent the hypervisor? And now, I don't actually, like, I, I can't mind read, I guess, is all I'd get at there. But that's how I kind of understood it. And yeah, I just, I mean, I'd agree with the upstream aspect, conclusion. though. Like, I think that's, that is more important. I think there should be the, like I mentioned, greater priority on being able to pull in those patches. Yeah. And they even point out, like, the info leak that he used, um, I guess, is a zero day on Samsung because he said, you know, that's a year old. And that's a kind of a highlight. 365 day. 365 day, yep. Yeah. But on Samsung, it's a zero day because they haven't updated to include that patch, which, you know, we've talked about a lot on this podcast of previous issues that have existed for or have been patched for years in the mainline Linux kernel that have just not been pulled down into Android because of the fragmentation. So, you know, I absolutely agree with that um, standpoint. You know, the Android ecosystem does make it really hard to um make sure that issues are patched like some android distros you don't even need a zero day to hit it really you just need um you know a bug within the last year that just hasn't been pulled downstream uh which is you know it's dangerous when you're talking about mobile stuff um i do want to say we do have uh another resource as well that talks about this bug um you know, the, there was a, I think it was a sec list link originally. We're rehosting the text to show it uh, on screen, but there's also some exploit yeah, files you can pull. Yeah, I mean, storm, the link's sorry, in that's chat. What it was. Yeah, so, you know, the, the packet storm is there. There's the exploit uh, proof of concept and stuff if you want to check that out. Um, yeah, this, this is definitely a bit more dense than the other, the Project Zero post. Yeah, but it is worth mentioning this is by the same guy. Uh, I think the Project Zero post was just like a more touched up more accessible version of this. Um, yeah. But yeah, this was all done by Jan Horn. So it's not like somebody, you know, um, sniping his work, I guess. Uh, it's all his work, so. Um, but we do have another Samsung kernel issue. We, we have Two no more, shortage actually. of them. Too. Yeah, <laughs> we had no shortage of them. Um, you, another use after free, another race yielding use after free, um, this time in the media transfer protocol, MTP. Anybody who's used Android, you might be familiar with this. Uh, it's very common when you plug in your phone, it'll ask you if you want to use the MTP mode or if you want to use it, you know, all these different modes you can use and MTP is one of them. Um, so there was a race condition in their iOctal handler for send file with header. And it's funny because the Google code base, uh, they say the Google code base actually runs this handler under a lock, but Samsung doesn't. So I guess they're, they changed they made modifications to this that actually made it vulnerable. And uh, the reason for or this is Or it was because... maybe like an earlier version. Google didn't have the lock in there. Like, I don't know yeah. if they actually specify that and I didn't go and look. 
Yeah, it could uh, be but a essentially, this too. needs to be locked. <laughs> yeah, and basically, they not. access a pointer in the dev object, um, and you know, anytime you're accessing a pointer on a shared object, you need a lock because uh, you want to make sure you have exclusive access when you're copying pointer references. Uh, but you know, they don't. So you know, one thread could drop the reference and free it when another thread resumes. It uses that same UAF pointer and, or well, that freed pointer, and you have a UAF. Um, this issue, though, it isn't reachable from an unprivileged user. Uh, you do need a privileged user, not root, but you do need, uh, I think it's like the MTP user group or something like that. So it's a privilege escalation, but it's not a privilege escalation from, you know, completely unprivileged. So that is worth mentioning because it's not. Yeah, uh, that definitely know, limits where this will be used. Yeah. And this was another issue that was, of course, found by Jan Horn. Uh, he's going went around just killing when uafs man especially i guess he's on a samsung tirade so um he's this week yeah but yeah so you know another race yielding uaf uh which you know that's that's basically what you're looking for in kernels nowadays because locking is just so difficult um but we do have another issue that actually isn't uh yielded by a race in the samsung kernel this is a heap out of bounds right um, this is in the TS Mux, uh, which is the transport stream Muxer uh, for Samsung phones. Yeah, and I'm just going to kind of come in here and say, one, this is another, you know, Project Zero finding, this time by Ian Beer. Um, yeah. But as a write-up, this is the type of write-up I... So it's not that I dislike write-ups that have more information, but this one's very straight to the point. Here's the lines of code. This line, it does this, and then just, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, you can see on screen, just down to, here are the controlled values, super straightforward, super easy to understand, there's the details that you care about, and not much extra. Yeah, it's just an integer overflow leading to an out-of-bounds right. Yeah, um, it's, it's really just that, you know, attacker controls all the values that get added up, and... Uh, and yeah, attacker control 32 bit value is ORed into the value at the attacker controlled offset. Now, I will say on that note, um, that is a common trait of Ian Beer's reports. Um, you know, I've looked at a lot of Ian Beer's previous findings, not specifically in Samsung, but in, you know, in uh, WebKit and stuff like that. And all of his reports are like, no fluff, very straight to the point. Here's the issue, fix it. Um, so, you know, that's just the, the kind of reports he writes. Uh, yeah, and I mean, nice. earlier we were saying it's nice to see kind of the information, the struggle, too. But, but I, sometimes you do just want the summarized, quick, here's how you, here's the issue. We want right? our cake and, or, you know, have your cake and eat it, too. Yeah, we're very spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, but yeah, it, I thought, I. it's rare, though, that you get the reports that are this just concise even when it, they're not covering the frustrations it's funny you it's rare you get the frustrations and it's rare you get the concise you you often get like the kind of in between where you got a you get a lot of information that isn't it's it's kind of redundant it's not really relevant to the actual issue um well not relevant or it's relevant but either um really basic like a bunch of fundamental ideas around it that kind of lead to the exploit or a bunch of stories around it would be the other way I've seen some go. Yeah. So I guess, you know, in the future, uh, I'm going to be totally spoiled here and say it would be cool if we got write-ups that had both. Uh, you know, you had like that, you know, struggle that we were talking about earlier, but also maybe just like a TLDR version that's kind of like this. Uh, I think that would be like, you know, 10 out of 10 report. Obviously, you know, I don't think that's reasonable to expect from people. But yeah, this is like Ian Beer's report style, and I really like it too. I like how he has like the comments that just have the A, B, C, and then, you know, um, have the brief little excerpts explaining what's happening on those lines. Um, this is another bug that is not accessible from uh, unprivileged. You do need a privileged context. I think in this one, it's uh, media, uh, the media user group. So this is another one where, you know, it's not quite as serious as it could be. Um, I will say I was a bit surprised to see Ian Beer report this issue. Uh, he's typically more of like an Apple guy. He's usually on iOS stuff. I don't, I haven't seen him too often uh, talking about Android. So maybe he's like trying to branch out. Uh, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting uh, that he's kind of looking at Android. I, I hope he's not uh, planning to move in that area because uh, 
he'll just dominate it and push push everyone else out because Ian Beer's like a he's kind of a god when it comes to finding issues and killing them. <laughs> so, you know, um, but yeah, maybe he's moving into Android, but uh, you know, something I found interesting. Um, just one second. Uh, yeah, so we do have some more Linux kernel issues. Not in Samsung, though. This one's just in Linux kernel. Um, so this was another really cool write-up. Um, and it's another race yielding use after free. Uh, this time in the video for Linux uh, subsystem, uh, V4L2. And uh, so this was actually an issue found. He found it in syscaller on a modified kernel. And this driver is shipped on a lot of common distros. Uh, Ubuntu, Debian, Arch. Um, but the, the thing that kind of limited its impact was he couldn't figure out how to auto-load the vulnerable driver. So he couldn't, you know, um, since it's not auto-loaded, it has to get loaded manually. It's not as impactful um, as, you know, he kind of hoped it could be. But the issue is very similar to an issue we already covered. It's basically an unlock and relock anti-pattern. Um, so, you know, drop the lock, do something that could sleep, and then relock. And like I said earlier, this is very common because you don't, really want to be holding a lock while you're calling an API function that could be sleeping. Um, and they kind of actually go into that because he kind of, he tried to ship a fix for this issue and Linus kind of, uh, you know, they ended up fixing the race condition, but they ended up introducing a uh, busy wait, uh, like a, like an infinite loop kind of thing. So, you know, it was kind of funny seeing they, they went into some of the details about how tough it was to patch it just because of how hard uh, concurrency is to manage. Um, but yeah, it's another race-induced UAF. Uh, this time the object was in a KMALIC 1024 cache. This is a, like a very good cache, because like I was saying, the smaller the object, the harder it is to hit. 1024 is very rarely used. So <clears throat> if you could get this driver auto-loaded, uh, this would be a very effective uh, exploit. But uh, this one, you know, they talk about some of the challenges uh, when it came to exploiting it, which, you know, as we were saying earlier, it's kind of nice to see. Um, and one of the biggest issues that he encountered when trying to exploit the issue is he needed to fake a kernel object, uh, a function table specifically, um, because he was going for an RIP hijack through a function pointer, which is pretty common in kernel. Um, but when you, you know, when you're talking about SMAP and stuff like that, secure uh, or supervisor mode access prevention, uh, and on top of the fact that you don't want to try to fake kernel objects in userland if you don't have to, because userland can get paged out. So if the kernel is running in a context where um, you know your your fake object isn't paged in, it will crash when it goes to dereference it. And uh, he talked about a, a trick he kind of used to get around that, and that was basically putting his fake object on the kernel stack and then holding it there. Uh, using the, us the user fault FD trick to make sure that that thread kind of hangs and then your payload is there and then you have a kernel address, right? It's in the kernel stack. Um, it's a very cool idea. He credits uh, Zeri for it, which is another name that you might be familiar with if you're interested in Linux kernel. Um, the question then becomes, how do you get a stack address? And basically what he did was he triggered a warning intentionally uh, to get a stack address printed out and then uh, used a slide to get the address of his fake object. This is neat. Uh, it's not really useful in real-world exploits because it's a bit too noisy. You generally don't want to trigger warnings or anything like that uh, because you know if you were you know if you were a nation state, let's say, trying to use this zero day, you don't want to set off warnings on the target system. Um, and if you can't get those warnings, like certain systems like Debian, you can't access the uh, D message, for example, without being root. So that wouldn't really work on those types of systems. But, you know, it's cool. It worked for, uh, you know, his purposes. But we really, like, I think it's really awesome that we shout this out because the number of uh, good write-ups when it comes to Linux kernel exploits, I think is, you could probably, it's probably in the single digits. Uh, and I should say, like, ones that are within, like, the last five years. You know, there's quite a few resources out there from, like, 10, 15 years ago, but a lot of those aren't really too relevant because the code base has changed so much. I think this is another write-up that, you know, it's obviously very new. It was just published two days ago, uh, and it has a lot of useful information that you can apply to other exploits that you could be I will on. add that this is actually a presentation from OffensiveCon, uh, like, just ended. I was just going on last week. Yeah, that's a good um, And the slides are available here. There's no video yet, but um, OffensiveCon, I believe, does upload their videos. They've got a YouTube channel for it. 
<clears throat> yeah, so I mean, yeah, and they even have a demo video. So I think this is a really good write-up, and I think it can be useful to people writing exploits uh, of a similar nature. So it's a very good reference point. So even if, you know, you're not interested in Linux kernel exploitation and you don't want to read it to get some system knowledge, if you are already interested in it and familiar with it, this could be a very good reference point for any bugs that are of like a similar nature. Did you have anything to add on that? See, I know I kind of rambled on there no, for a no, while. He on did one. I just, okay. Yeah. I really enjoyed that, uh, that exploit. So I kind of, uh, took it away there. Keeping on the con on the, uh, you know, topic of kernel, uh, we have a white paper that talks about trying to automatically generate, uh, exploits for out of bounds rights in uh, the kernel. Well, so to be so, fair, it's towards that, but it doesn't go so far as actually expo or actually coming up with a full exploit plan. Um, oh yeah, so it's more just to demonstrate that it is exploitable. Uh, well, no. So it it expects you it expects to be given a proof of concept. Um, like it expects that you give it a proof of concept of an out of bounds right in the kernel. And it will figure out It'll figure how, out the capabilities of how it. you, yeah, the capabilities are one part of it. Um, and it'll try and figure out any sort of heap setup that'll help get useful information nearby. So it's, it's focusing on like heap overwrites. Um, so one of the things it does, is it'll say so uses uh, what it refers as capability guided fuzzing. So rather than being guided by coverage, like syscaller, AFL, something like that, which looks at the coverage. Its focus is on expanding the capabilities of a heap overflow. Like it's a very focused fuzzer in terms yeah. of kind of how it works. It's more designed towards triaging issues because yeah, you have an exploit about... and then how useful is it? Um, yeah. I think what you're going to say is they talk about their example case where there was an out of bounds right that had eight additional bytes kind of being written. Um, and the value would appear like you just have a constant written. Uh, those eight additional bytes were always a constant. But with their research, it turns out that you no, know, those bytes were actually controllable through another syscall, through, you know, set sock opt. Um, so from there, you can actually set that value and suddenly it becomes a lot more exploitable when you can control the value of what's being written. So that's kind of where they want to look at this process of being able to extract capabilities from the exploits. Kind of, so give, again, given a proof of concept, discover all of the out of bounds access points, um, identify what the vulnerable object actually is. So they use uh, symbolic tracing to kind of do that. Um, and they do that because uh, KA sans, so kernel address sanitizer will only kind of track certain big rights and they want to have a much more granular look at this. So they track every object for every memory access uh, to kind of extract what the intended object was and then compare if they're actually hitting it. That's the symbolic tracing aspect. So finds all of that information and then go ahead. I was just going to expand on that a little bit. Uh, the reason that um, Asan can kind of miss it's kind of has a weakness when it comes to out of bounds rights and stuff like that is because uh, for people who don't really know too much about how a SAN works um, at a basic level, what it, it uses red zones. So it sets up zones that it, if any rights or reads uh, go into it, you know, those red zones are set up outside of the bounds of, um, of what's typically accessible. So it uses those red zones to try to detect memory corruption. So because of, you know, because of how granular you can get with out of bounds rights, if it's if it happens on a very close adjacent object, it won't be able to hit a red zone. So that's why it doesn't get detected. So that's why they had to go with the symbolic tracing. Uh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to kind of expand on why that was the case. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, and good point. Uh, but yeah, so they use the symbolic tracing, and then as we mentioned, they use. They start off with an out of bounds proof of concept and mutate it in order to try and determine its capability. So again, looking at that tracing, uh, looking at you know how it's being used, and I I thought that was just a neat idea here. Um, again, kind of as it's already mentioned, it's not necessarily going to be finding a lot of new vulns, but when you have a crash that maybe doesn't look exploitable, this might show you that it actually is. The statistics behind it. Like, of what it was finding, what, 
It's pretty significant. 11 out of 17, I think, they were able to generate exploits for using the tool. Well, so what I was going to get at more is like um, the number of public exploits, number of generate exploits, you know, so they have a exploit and they'll find like 66 in this one case here uh, or 208 potential exploits there, like potential ways that it could be used. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of cases like that. Like it's it's opening up the usage a lot. It's doing a lot that would have taken a fair amount of manual manual assessment, which is kind of a pain. Like you really need to understand the code to start digging through how useful some of these are. Um, and as we mentioned, it's really easy to miss the fact that hey, you actually do control this value or. You do control the address. It's just in some other really obscure place. This is trying to find that. So I, I think it's a very cool idea. Um, and once it's done all of this with the capabilities, it does try to look for some exploit primitives. Uh, once it knows the capability, can it set up the heap in some way uh, so that you know appropriate data is in the right place? Can it do some heap spraying? So it looks at stuff like that. Like I said, it's not able to generate just the full exploit chain, but it's starting to get you there. Yeah, something that's really cool that I think uh, we haven't mentioned yet is they actually implemented this tool. Uh, Kobe is what it's called. I think it's you know kind of homage to uh, Kobe, who obviously a lot of people know uh, recently passed. But um, they actually built it on top of um, existing fuzzers like uh, Syscaller. Uh, S2E and Anger, I think they built it on top of. So, like, like I was saying earlier, what this really ha helps with is triaging. So this doesn't really try to compete with fuzzers like Syscaller. It tries to build on top of it, and I think that's really cool. Um, and obviously, I mean, the, the motivation behind this is, especially when you're talking about something as large as Linux kernel, you end up finding a lot of issues. Um, if you look at, like, some of the public Syscaller dashboards, you'll have pages upon pages of issues, some of them even from like a year ago that still haven't been fixed. So in those cases, triaging is super important. So knowing the capability that a bug has in terms of exploitability is very, it's important for prioritizing those bugs to get them fixed first over some of the more useless issues, like let's say a CPU stall or something like that. Um, so, you know, that's where this really comes into play is trying to triage those issues. And that's the problem they're trying to solve. And when building that on top of Syscaller, you know, that kind of gets going right away. It kind of tries to cut out that manual review that's needed, like you were saying. And I think that's what's really cool uh, is that they're trying to build something new on top of existing. Yeah, fuzzers. assisting the manual review too, just giving that extra information. Um, I will also mention performance is... I mean, it's not amazing performance. They talk about some of these, like the tracing in one case takes nearly three minutes. But I mean, three minutes, or sorry. Uh, okay, so I'm just looking at the stats there. One of them there says the fuzzing takes like uh, three hours, just over. But <laughs> e even so, um, like that's nothing when it comes down to the amount of time that the fuzzers are running to be doing some triage on it. Uh, most of these steps are done in seconds or minutes. I'd say it's reasonably good performance, especially compared to stuff that often takes hours to pull out information with. And consider, yeah, it would take that long with a human probably. And on top of that, you know, you got to consider this isn't happening every test case. It's only happening on test cases where issues are actually found. Yeah. So that time investment is worth it. Uh, so yeah, very cool paper. I think it like, I, I, I honestly think we'll see this start to become, uh, hopefully it'll become more, um, common. You know what I mean? It'll become more used. It's, it's going to be practical. I think it's going to be a lot more practical than some yeah, of the other things so. we've seen. Uh, we do have a PDF on hot fuzz as well, although it's not coming up on my screen. Oh, um, that's weird. Yeah, but hot fuzz is, uh, you know, keeping on the topic of fuzzing and automated tools. Uh, we've talked about, you know, algorithm, algorithmic complexity, uh, AC bugs in the past. Uh, we actually talked about it in the previous episode in regards to uh, regex um, and DOSing systems. And this paper is about trying to discover those types of vulnerabilities in Java libraries uh, using something they coin micro fuzzing. Um, so... Yeah, do you want to get into like micro fuzzing? Because I know we were talking about this paper a little bit before the stream. 
Yeah. Oh, so basically their idea of micro fuzzing and I've brought up the abstract at least since the paper wasn't loading. Um, their idea of micro fuzzing or basically the new thing with this Spectre mentioned looking for those algorithmic issues. Micro fuzzing is essentially where you're breaking down the library into all of its functions individually. This focuses on doing it with Java. I couldn't find any release of any actual tools. So yeah, I don't know if Could there's something out there thing. or not. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I checked his GitHub and it, it wasn't on there. So I was kind of expecting it to be. Um, yeah. Regardless, it's really similar. Like I've done testing like this where I see a function that seems a little bit weird. So I copy that code out and just start hitting it kind of manually. Um, he's calling it micro fuzzing. I'm not entirely sure this is a unique concept or a novel concept. I couldn't name any fuzzers that operate at this level though. So it's definitely possible. Um, as far as I can tell, micro fuzzing is only being, is a term that they've coined. Um, yeah. but I mean, the idea definitely isn't new. Like I mentioned, I've definitely done testing kind of similar to that just by pulling out the functions, not at this sort of automated level. Just in doing manual assessments, I've looked at it like this before. Yeah, um, basically what they try to do is use like the type definitions and stuff for functions and uh, try to automatically generate test harnesses, which they say is what they kind of bring new to the table. I will say, I, I don't know why they called that micro fuzzing. That seems like a very unintuitive term for it. Well, I think um, it makes sense because they're they because the other thing they are doing they are breaking down to all the libraries functions that they're pulling out. It's not just the functions that can be hit or called externally. Um, it is all the functions. Okay, I guess that kind of makes sense. Um, so that that's little. where I think the micro comes down because they're only fuzzing the little function. They're not fuzzing the entire library or like a holistic fuzz. Okay, um, I can see that's, that. That's that's where the micro fuzzing I believe comes from. Uh. And I mean, there there are benefits to that. I've already kind of touched on the downside, though, being that it doesn't account for the actual entry points or any protections around some of those calls. It's only looking at the function specifically, uh, which may or may not be reachable or hittable as expected. And, and I think the other issue is, too, is that, like uh, they mentioned, it's it's a lot easier to get false positives. Uh, well, that you would get false issue. positives because you're not doing that, because you're not yeah. going through the entire chain. There's a lot of calls that just won't be possible. Um, and yeah, as already mentioned, it doesn't attempt to crash it. It just attempts to maximize resource consumption. Yeah. So I will say, like, uh, they do have some, like, promising results for what they were trying to, like, go for uh they said they found 26 um previously unknown vulnerabilities in the java 8 jerry and they found 132 issues in 47 of the top 100 libraries found on maven so it, it seems like you know it is getting results when you're looking at fuzzers you know the number one metric is does it actually find issues you can talk about the performance all day long but if it doesn't find issues it's it's a paperweight um but apparently like, according to the results it does actually find the types of issues they're looking for so i think that you know that's worth noting is that it's not yeah. just a uh, theory you know they've they tested it out and it does find issues um so it looks it looks promising for that um so we do have a few um uh, shout outs as yeah. well. Yeah, well, so t carrying on the promising thing, another okay. fuzzer that came up that looks promising. So this actually came out just a little bit over a week ago. Fortunately, I didn't see it um, until uh, about an hour before we planned to stream this. So I have not read all of this, but I thought I'd shout it out anyhow because what I have read looks kind of interesting. Um, and this is Hypercube, high dimensional hypervisor fuzzing. Uh, basically custom operating system that attempts to fuzz whatever hypervisor it's running under. Um, like I said, I haven't had a chance to actually read everything in here, so I can't give a really deep comment. I did want to show this out that's there. I think this looks really interesting. It's something I do plan to kind of take a look at and both run and use and, you know, get back to finishing up the paper. But um, they have a focus on trying to be efficient with their methodology, having quick tests or tests that can be run fairly quickly. Versus, you know, taking two seconds to start off with like QEMU uh, ba basic Linux setup. You know, they're looking on the Spectre. I think you had pulled the numbers being like quarter of a second. 
Yeah, so they mentioned, um, you know, with a Linux minimalist kernel running like a busy box type image, uh, it takes about 2.6 seconds, I think, to uh, boot, uh, whereas theirs, it only takes like 0.26 or something like that. Yeah, and talk about so, yeah, test they being... a lot on like high throughput uh, test cases, yeah. Yeah, and the other thing is trying to hit more areas than what, uh, so they mentioned being able to hit, hit everything, port IO, M MMIO, PCI, hypercall interface, it's like being able to hit a lot more than what like QEMU might hit or like running a Linux thing under QEMU might be able to hit. Yeah. Now I, I will say like those stats, uh, the 2.6 seconds thing, I will say um, one thing I found kind of weird about that is in practice, if you've actually tried running a Linux image under QEMU, 2.6 seconds for the actual boot process is accurate. That's about what I get. But they're not considering that uh, often when you're running, like booting up an image from QEMU, it doesn't start booting right away. It usually takes a few seconds before that boot process even comes into effect. And that's going to kind of bottleneck it because even if your boot only takes a quarter of a second, if it takes a few seconds before it even boots, that's going to bottleneck your throughput. So I find it kind of weird that they didn't mention, well, I didn't see them mention that. They might have mentioned that. Well, I think they just, mentioned that, the like, thing. the overall chain taking, like, up to eight seconds with a Linux image, but around two seconds with their operate, like, the full test. Okay, that's around that. So that's still shaving. Uh, oh, you're definitely shaving time. I just, you know, that is something I kind of noticed, and I know from, like, personal experience with QAMU. Uh, but, yeah, that was just something I noticed with those stats. Uh, but yeah, this does look like very interesting. Uh, I think it is absolutely like cool that they wrote their own OS. I think it's justified for what they're trying to do. Uh, instead of using something like Linux, you get far less noise. It's targeting exactly what you want. You're not including all this like other bloat uh, needlessly. So yeah, this looks very cool. Uh, I definitely, yeah, at the I same time it. though, I feel like there's going to be a lot of cases where you're going to want something that you can do from Linux in your fuzzing. Like you're going, or you're going to want something that you can do from an operating system that's probably running under the hypervisor. And perhaps there's a chance that something like this is going to catch issues that, you know, Linux just wouldn't let you do that period. For example, hmm. I, I mean, I think there's a danger of that. I still like it. Like, like I said, I am interested in this. I want to give it a quick shout out because I think it is, it looks interesting. Yeah. But sure. I mean, I, I could see there maybe being something in that area or maybe not. Like I said, I haven't finished reading it, so I don't want to make any claims about it. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, we do have a few other uh, shout outs as well uh, that we'll, we'll get around to here, like uh, Fido2 Deep Dive. Yeah, and I mean, we're not going to go into the details here. Just a shout out. Last episode, we talked about the uh, that open source key um, and touched a little bit on some of the auth stuff. And this is pro and I just happened to kind of come across um, this kind of deep dive into attestations. Um, and I thought this was fairly well written. Just something worth like if if that's an area you want to look at, want to kind of understand, it's a pretty good write up. Um, as usual, I mean, the link's down in the description. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of shout it out there. I didn't want to cover it too much on the episode. And the other thing that I had brought up just as a quick shout out is Hypervisor Necromancy, uh, which is out of the frack feed, uh, reanimating kernel protectors or on emulating hypervisors, a Samsung RKP case study, which is more or less what it sounds trying to emulate a hypervisor talks about some of the issues sounds really cool but i feel like i'd be too dumb to follow it <laughs> a very long paper too yeah which is oh. common of frack to be fair like, yeah I, I mean it's long. some definitely can be it's uh but yeah again just one for shout outs there for the end here um mm -hmm. i don't think we have any other topics to cover no we're uh we're we're pretty much done on topics uh before we close out the show I will mention, uh, we do have the VODs up on YouTube. Uh, we also have uh, Spotify and uh, Apple Apple Podcasts uh, through the, yeah, the, 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 the podcast Yeah, we've got a bunch of the apps there, so. 
yeah, so all the links will be in the description uh, if you want to check those out. We also have a Discord, which we you know send out notifications on when we're going live and stuff like that, uh, and a Twitter, which we also send notifications out on. So you know if you're interested in that, uh, definitely follow us on Twitter and check out our Discord. Um, and yeah, that that pretty much sums up uh, this episode. We will be back again next Monday at the same time, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we might be doing some streams this week, uh, looking at some Chrome stuff. Uh, if I can, you know, get it all set up and uh, pull the pull. Are the you going to try the um, the Project Zero Chrome bug? Are you going to go through with that one? No, no, <laughs> that one looks like hell. No, no, it, this is another one I found. Uh, there is a public write up for it, but since I don't know much about Chrome, I thought doing some of that research process on stream could be cool. Uh, you mentioned you kind of pushed me towards doing that, so I think I am going to try to do that this week. So uh, just follow our Twitter to, you know, we'll let you know when we're going to be doing that. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, we will see you guys next week for sure. Uh, same time on Monday and we'll see you guys then.